Welcome to Spectrum Perspectives, real talk with parents, professionals, and autism advocates with your host, Cindy Gellermini. Hi, everyone. This is Cindy with another episode of Spectrum Perspectives. And today I have Dr. Richard Bowles with us. Hi, Dr. Bowles. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so let's start at the beginning a little bit. I just would like to know, um, I know you are a doctor, but you can let us know what type of doctor you, you are. And I would like to know how you got into the field that you're in now of working with kids with autism. Well, I, I love kids and so I was a pediatrician and I like challenges, particularly things that no one else can figure out. Um, in my practice and in my training, I found a lot of kids that nobody could figure out what to do with to make them better. And I liked the challenge of that. So I went into genetics because I felt that would be a growing field. I went into that quite a while ago when there was very little that we can do and it's increased dramatically what we can do since then. Um, I was in metabolism, inborn errors of metabolism, metabolic disorders, because those were rare disorders, but we can do something about. But a lot of kids were coming to me with things that nobody could figure out. Um, it's one of the special ones. I mean, it's autism. I mean, even back then, there was a few here and there, nothing like now. And I got involved in some of the more esoterical things at the time, like cyclic vomiting and unusual migraines and chronic fatigue syndrome and irritable bowel and the type of things that no one else wanted to get involved with because I was hoping that a genetic approach would help. And then I, then there was the autism explosion. And so that I got involved in that, particularly since so many of the brothers of my patients had autism. And so I figured that there must be some genetic link between what I was studying and autism. So that's sort of a long story, but that's how I got into it. How long ago are we talking about? When when was that? Well, I've been seeing kids with autism for 30 years now and treating them as metabolic disorders for 30 years, but it was really 10 years ago that I started concentrating on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with it, that's exactly the time frame that you would have seen. So, so my son, Robbie, he was born in 1989 and it was one in 10,000 kids. And I've watched you know, he'd be 33 now. So, and I watched the rates go up and up and up and up. So how many kids did you see with autism back then, right? Compared to what you have now. And I was told as a medical student that there's this new disease that's been described as autism and you might see it once in your career. <laughs> was, yeah, I, it, that's the way it was. Right, right. Huh. Um, okay, so, so you got... You, you went to work with genetics. So explain that a little bit, like, because, and, and the reason this is interesting to me is because there's different theories about what people think cause autism. So all common disorders are a combination of genetic factors and environmental factors. I mean, everything, it, high blood pressure, asthma, diabetes, cancer, it doesn't matter what it is, heart disease, stroke, they're all a combination of multiple genetic factors. They tend to run in families and environmental factors. I mean, the way that you live makes a difference. And autism is no different than that. Autism does have a higher genetic component than all, any of the other um, common disorders. That doesn't mean that it's not treatable in any way. As a geneticist, I tried to determine the genetic component in my patient and then use that to come up with a, with a personalized medicine approach to treat that individual. I usually say child because I'm a pediatrician, but many times this in your Robbie, they do grow up. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Well, do you still see them after they, they're grown? Do you see them as a geneticist and as, instead of a pediatrician? Uh -huh. I mean, I see them up till age 30 as the okay. primary physician. Okay. And then thereafter, well, if they're already my patient, it doesn't matter what age they are. But as new patients, I don't take them after age 30. But I do work with other physicians to help them understand how to order the genetic testing, interpret the genetic testing, and treat the disorder, whatever is found on genetic testing. So okay. indirectly, yeah, I do um, work with... Um, uh, people of all ages. So I had my son tested um, for a couple of different sy syndromes, like fragile X and things like that, and everything came back negative. So I'm just, but that was a long time ago. So I'm but curious what you're finding. Very, very little. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you had exome sequencing, which is what most universities do today, 
And that was the big thing five years ago. Exome sequencing is still less than 1% of the DNA. I mean, most of the centers are finding about 20% or so that they can find a genetic cause, which is much better. It used to be a few percent when I started. Mm -hmm. But I do whole genome sequencing and whole and trios. That means both biological parents and the individual. And in that, I can find the genetic cause about 75% of the time. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's that high now. Not every case, but about 75%. Wow. And are you testing the parents also, or like, is there a way to find out where it came from? Well, you have to test the parents because the most, I mean, most of the genetic causes that I find are de novo mutations, such as new in Latin, is not in either parent. And so the way that's done is we have the entire sequence. This is all 3 billion nucleotides, so the entire DNA sequence. We look at the part that is involved in sequencing the proteins, which is about 1% of it. And we look for anything that is in the individual that is absent in both parents that changes the proteins, any of the 23,000 proteins in any way at all. The average person has 0 0.3 de novo variants. That means if out of 10 people, three of them will have a de novo variant that affects the protein code, the amino acid code. So they do happen in normal people. But in people with autism, mostly I find one, and that's usually the cause of the autism. About 50% of the time, I can find a de novo variant, which is the main genetic contributor to autism in that individual. Um, and there's other de novos that I find that sometimes there are gray zones, that they're de novos that I'm not quite sure if they're related to autism or not, and we have to do further research. But the ones that I find that are very highly likely and can be cause, called the cause of the disease, I find in half of people with autism. And then there's inherited variants here and there that occur that come from one parent or the other, usually some from both parents, and that it's the combination contributed to autism, along with environment. Environment is always a component in everybody. Mm -hmm. what, the de novo, what is that? Explain that. It just means new in Latin. It's a new mutation. It was Oh, not it's just present. a new, oh, okay. I, I understand. Okay. New mutation. Yeah, most, I mean, most of autism is genetic, but it's not inherited. It's a new mutation, not in the parents. Really? So where would that come from? Um, where, I mean, all the chemicals and everything were polluting our environment, I presume. Most of these occur in spermatogenesis. That's the formation of the sperm cells. They probably happened in the father, maybe even when the father was a baby or a child decades earlier. Mm -hmm. But um, they 90% do occur on the male line. Now, the chromosomal abnormalities we do see in maybe 10% or so of autism, those almost always occur on the female line. So there are ones, oh. there are different mechanisms from each. Hmm. But the new mutations presumably are being caused by some sort of chemical or other substance which causes the dna change and that can happen so I mean, chemicals in the environment can change your dna i think that's why autism has exploded in the last few generations if you look at other countries they're just starting to talk about an explosion now i'm um, tomorrow i'm going to eastern europe i'm going right. to give some talks there i've been there a couple times already um in i was in india a few months ago and in saudi arabia they're just starting to talk about the explosion now Mm -hmm. um, I think that they were a bit behind, you know, some places were behind in the, um, in the chemical development and in the in industrial development, and they're starting to pick it up, but it's seen all over the world now. Yeah. I've been hearing people recently just talking about the chemicals that are in just kids' cereals and things like that, that are not allowed in Europe, like in Italy, they're, they're not allowed to put those certain chemicals in their food that we have here. So that makes me wonder what the autism rates are, you know, in places like that compared to us. You know, I don't They're know. They're very high in Europe as well, but yeah. Europe is often heavily, you know, it's heavily industrialized. And so they have high, they have high autism levels. Okay. So it's not necessarily just food. It's, it's the environment in general. I wish that I knew exactly what it is. I mean, we have some ideas. I mean, it could be things like heavy metals and those are in foods. It could be there's, but there's many different possibilities, but we really don't know. I, I think that it's important to have money going to research to try to figure out what is going on. Yeah, because the scary thing is, is that these mutations occurred a long time ago. How many mutations are occurring now that will affect children thirty years from now? So, if we're talking about genetics, right? Mm -hmm. I know of people that have had twins, and one is autistic and one is not. 
you know, and I always wonder, how does that happen? They're both cooking in the womb at the same time. How does one end up autistic and the other doesn't? But I guess they just have different DNA. Well, they, they share half the DNA if they're not identical. And anyway, even if they were identical, one of them, the, the mutation usually occurs before the zygote. So in identical twins, it's usually in both of those. And I have some identical twin pairs and the same de novo mutation is mm -hmm. in both pairs, but it's not in the parents because it occurred way before the zygote split into two. Right. But I mean, in siblings, there's many sib pairs that I have and they have, there's different ways. I mean, one of the ways to have siblings, particularly if both siblings are severe, they often will have different de novo mutations. Huh. Uh, the, the dad was exposed to a chemical or whatever, and it caused different problems, you know, a different mutation in each, in each sperm. Wow. So, I also see a lot of asymmetrical pairs where there is a very severely affected and then a high, you know, a, a high functioning. Right. And usually what those are is that the de novo is only in the severely affected and then the high functioning doesn't have a de novo. Most mm -hmm. people that are high functioning, I don't find de novos. There are exceptions, but most of them have inherited variants from both parents. Um, the de novos also have inherited pair from both parents because a de novo mutation doesn't necessarily cause autism. It can cause intellectual disability, what we used to call mental retardation. It can mm -hmm. cause seizures. It can cause many other things. But to steer it towards autism usually is because there's other genetic changes which push it in that direction. And those genetic changes could affect another sibling and push it in that direction as well. So it's complicated. There's other ones. I have several sib pairs. We're hoping to publish it soon. But... Right. There are different mechanisms. There's X-linked as well, which severely affected male, mildly affected female, and there's other types. But it, it, the genetics of autism is very complex. And even in an individual with a de novo mutation, which is the main cause of autism, there's modifying genes which make a difference. Mm -hmm. And those modifying genes are particularly important because sometimes the main mutation is not treatable, but the modifying genes are treatable. And so that's why I do whole genome sequence. Even when I find it, I don't stop. I go through the whole thing because I may find something that's treatable and the you know ninety percent through. Wow, wow, my wheels are spinning as you're talking. Um, we'll we'll get to the treatable, but I have discussed on one of my other episodes with a parent about splitting up the the diagnosis because autism is so broad you know when you're mentioning you know kids are more high functioning and then the more more severe i, I don't think they should be in the same category um because the the ones that are more severe like my son have have much higher support needs and they need you know other things and you can't lump them all together you can't put you know somebody who's 22 years old and still wearing a diaper in, in the same category as somebody that has a master's degree you know so i'm just yeah. wondering if we can actually look at the the genes and say hey they these have this and these have that and we can give them different names and different categories and we can kind of split it up a little bit i don't know if that's you know the, a good there thing is or a bad thing but genetic split but the problem is is that there's everything in the middle as well Right. Not like there's two different categories and they're completely separate. There's everything in the middle. Everything in between. It, Correct. Everything in between. Yeah. Yeah. So any 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 place that you cut it would be somewhat arbitrary. Right. The ones that are very high functioning, they tend to have genetic components that come from both parents. And the ones that are very low functioning tend to be a de novo mutation from huh. neither parent. But the ones in the middle can be both or either or right. something else. Right. Right. Yeah. And at least if we keep them all under the autism umbrella, then they can all get the help mm -hmm. that they need as far as insurance and, and therapies and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's okay to have the umbrella as long as people on both sides realize that it's a very wide umbrella. And from where they're sitting, there can be people that are very different than them. Right. Um, all right. So once you find out what the the mutation is or whatever, um, the de novo, um, I like that word. <laughs> um, what, so you're saying some of it is treatable. So mm -hmm. explain, explain that. Well, I'm going to try to be simple <laughs> as you and a hundred other people have told me before. Yes. Um, there are thousands of ways to have autism. Okay. okay? Every child is different, mm -hmm. truly. And there are at least a thousand genes that can contribute to autism. And almost every patient I get has something different. Wow. But the pathways 
the way the genes make the disease are the pathways, the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. There are not that many, several. I mean, 10 or so. It's mm -hmm. not a thousand. So many, half of them are treatable and half of them are not treatable. Some of the treatable pathways, um, ion channels. It's one you may probably have not heard of, but I find ion channels very frequently in autism. Ion is a positively charged salt, calcium, sodium, potassium, et cetera. The channels, um, they can't go across the membrane unless they go through a door, a channel. So the channels are there to let the salts go through, but they're highly selective to a certain salt and they only let it go through at a certain time and at a certain amount. If they leak, then the ions, particularly cations, positively charged salts, leak into the cell and the cells are hyper excitable. Hyper excitable cells cause a lot of the symptoms the autistic features, the ADHD type things, the confusion, the mood disorders, not being able to learn very well because cells are hyper excitable and they're not really, and they're kind of firing off all over, as well as things like dizziness and nausea and pain and fatigue because cells in the rest of the body, nerve cells can be sending signals up towards the brain. And as well as nerves that go to other parts of the body, like the nerves that go to the intestines, so if they're hyper excitable, it can cause constipation or diarrhea, depending on the nerve, um, as well as many other problems. So I find that a lot of it has to do with hyper excitability. And if I find a cation channel abnormality that I think is related to the autism, I'm very happy because those are quite treatable. I'd say the vast majority are treatable. Um, there's many different ways to treat it. It depends on what the ion is and what the channel is and what the situation is. There, are, Some of them are treated by things like potassium or magnesium. Mm. Others are treated by helping the mitochondria. You always have an energy problem when you have a cation leak because it takes a lot of energy to pump those cations back out and you use up the energy. Think about like a dam that has a leak in it and you have a, an electric pump that's pumping the water back. As long as it's not raining, you have enough electricity, you might be able to make it work. But when you have a stressful situation like raining, the cells are way too hyperactive and stressed, you just can't pump it back fast enough. And then, of course, you run out of energy because you're constantly pumping. Um, that's a very energy requiring system. So the cations, and also there are ways, to, there are medications that will block certain channels. And the, ch the medication is different for each channel. So that's one. Another is just mitochondria. Mitochondria make the energy. So if there's a defect in making energy, you can't pump cations fast across. But you, the nerve cells are electrical, require energy, and the nerves require more energy than any other system in the body except for exercising muscle. So if you have a mitochondrial dysfunction, you can't make enough energy, or you're using it too fast because you're pumping all those ions back out. The cell runs out of energy and it's dysfunctional. People are always telling me, well, if my cells don't have enough energy, why does my kid have way too much energy? <laughs> that's the, okay, that's the toddler and the cookie jar metaphor, okay? Mm -hmm. Toddler says, I want a cookie. Mom says, no, I want a cookie. 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 Okay, that cookie is gone. The, in the inhibitory mom has to constantly be there to keep the excitatory toddler out of the cookie jar. For every excitatory nerve synapsing on another nerve cell, another brain cell, there are a lot of inhibitory nerve cells and they have to constantly fire or the excitatory cell will take over. They run out of energy first. Mom runs out of energy and she says, I got to get a break. That cookie's gone. That's why when your cells don't have enough energy, it's the inhibitory ones which run out first. Hmm. And so that's why you, another reason why you get cellular hyperexcitability is because that you, you have a problem with not having enough energy and the inhibitory neurons fall. And then there's neurotransmission because when a nerve fires, it doesn't, the nerves don't touch each other. It has to cause a neurotransmitter to be released across the synapse, the gap between the nerve cells to set off the next nerve cell. Well, there's inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters. And if they're out of balance, you can have a problem where you have too much excitation. So I've already given you three ways that you can have a, you know, the brain to be and the nervous system in general to be overexcited. Another is inflammation. Inflammation mm -hmm. irritates cells and excites, it makes them not act right. So, I mean, which one do you use to treat? 
Well, with DNA testing, I can find out what the problem is most of the time in an individual, and I can target the therapies on that. Most of the treatments that the MAP doctors use, you know, the integrative doctors, um, there's many different words for that. Um, biomed, yep. et cetera. Yep. Um, yep. Is that you probably had people talk about that on your show before. So yeah, I, I've, the... I've had um, a couple of doctors on from MedMaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Most of the treatments they use help those three pathways, those okay. four pathways. They affect cations, mitochondria, neurotransmission and inflammation. And so if you're not one of the people lucky enough to be able to have a geneticist look at your entire sequence, you can still take advantage of the fact that those are th those are pathways which are treatable, which are common in autism. Of course, it's better to know what pathway it is in your child so you can try those treatments first and just trying to throw things at the wall and seeing what sticks. But right. sometimes that approach does work. And you can see with the the MedMaps doctors are often highly successful in treating the patients because they have a repertoire of things by trial and error more than anything else that have worked. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the excitability and that I've, I've heard parents talk about their kids always being in fight or flight mode. Certain calcium channel genes, which often when they have leaks will do that in particular. So when kids are in that, I, there are things that I look at, but in reality, I mean, I have my gene list and I look at every variant in those, in that gene list. But I also look at any variant of any significance in all 23,000 genes. Otherwise, I'm never going to find new ones and be able to help the kids I haven't helped yet. But some of them, they don't necessarily need medication. You can use more natural uh, vitamins and things like that to help? Or I would, The vast majority, I use natural substances because most of the treatment for mitochondrial dysfunction, most of the treatment for cation leaks are natural. Um, mitochondrial cocktail we call it because there are a bunch of different things that are mixed together to help that mm -hmm. and there is cation cocktails as well that will help that so most of them are natural um some of the things some of the cation ones are medications i'd say neurotransmission is sort of 50 50 between um natural food um, supplements dietary supplements and uh, medications so it really depends on what the exact problem is in a child. Okay. And often I'll find most people have more than one. It's another thing I have to say there. Most of autism is not monogenic, one gene, but variants in many genes. Hmm. There's one that's de novo. If it's there, it's there half the time or more in my experience. Mm -hmm. And then there's inherited variants, which also modify the disease. And right. any one of those is a potential target for therapy. And often there'll be two, three, four, five different variants that I think are related to the disease. And each variant may have five to 10 different ideas I have for treatment. And so there's a huge laundry list of things that we can do. But then I say, okay, these are the ones that are most likely to help. These are based upon what I think is the problem. These are the ones that are most effective for those problems. And these are the ones that have the fewest side effects. And then we go through the list and decide where to start from. And usually it's starting with um, natural solutions. I know with my son, I've met, I've seen other boys and met other boys that almost, that they have similar look to him. They've got the same skinny legs, the same posture, the same shaped fingers. Um, and I would, and I say, they look like they could be brothers. And when I see that, I'm like, this has got to be some kind of genetic something, you know, cause down syndrome kids all have a certain look where you can tell that they're down yeah. syndrome, you know? And when I see this, I'm like, it makes me wonder, I'm like, there's gotta be something. And I have always, you know, and there's one who's, she's a, they're, they have a whole big following on social media and stuff. And I've tried to ask them, have they ever had genetic testing, but I can't get through to them. Um, cause I wanted to see if she found an answer. We could look for an answer and you could follow it on your podcast if you want. Yeah, but I, well, you can't, you can't test Robbie anymore, but you could do, and I don't, and I can't get in touch with this other person, but I'm just curious if you've ever seen that, if you've seen kids that almost kind of look alike that you've noticed, like if you see like the same gene mutation in, in a couple of people that, that you see that or no, there's just too many of them, too many different variations. Some people do have a certain look, what we call syndromic. Mm -hmm. um, when, and sometimes they have the gene that causes the syndrome, but they don't have that look. Um, in the past, geneticists such as myself were used 
we're trained to look at those features to make a diagnosis. But now mm -hmm. the genetics is so much more accurate. I usually start with that and see if the if it fits or not. But if it, it doesn't matter really how much it fits because that's what it is. I mean, if you find something that's clearly the problem. Right, right. I mean, you can't argue with it if you do a test and this is what comes back. It is what it is. Yeah. Do you have any hair? It's not necessarily too late. Uh, for, oh, for me. Oh, to test me. To test. No, to test Robbie. Oh, Robbie. Robbie passed away. I know. Yeah. Oh, so do I have oh, any of his hair? But the D, but you can get DNA. I have out of to Amanda. think I might have hair from his first haircut or, or a tooth. Yeah. I mean, that would, I, would I, I know that you're not going to use it for treatment or anything, but I mean, if you mm -hmm. wanted to know most right, likely if there was some kind of a, yeah, most likely we could figure it out. Okay. So, and then that would, but would that necessarily, I would say to my son when he gets married and he has kids that, you know, we don't know necessarily if his kids are going to have the same thing, unless it does come back as some kind of genetic something. I With don't know. Affected male an unaffected brother's children are unlikely to have the same problem. Right. Nothing is ever a hundred percent. Right. And I'm not your doctor, but it, the chance, the, there are no known genetic mechanisms that make it likely. Let's put it that way. Yeah. That and I think that's something that people want to know. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I would, I would want to know if I had a young child too, I would want to know like the lifespan, you know, like, like, is there anything that can tell you that? Um, like if it's, if this is some type of a syndrome that, you know, whatever, like, to the, I guess it can affect their health. Like, do the, does it affect their heart? Does it affect, you know, I know with Robbie, he had seizures, you know. But you, uh, Robbie had a chromosomal test, I assume, at some point. He had, yeah, he had something. This was a long time ago. I, the only one I remember was Fragile X because I, I wanted to see if that was the only thing I found online but, that sounded like that's what it would be. And it came back negative. Because a chromosomal abnormality would be the only realistic way that it could affect your son's children. And I, that's the type of technology that was around 30 years ago and would likely have been used. Yeah. But I think the thing that people are more interested in is, wait a minute, you can find out what's going on inside my child and you can fix some of these things. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can help. That's, that's amazing. That's really most of the time, I mean, it's hard to really figure out exactly what it is that help, but the vast majority of the kids do get better with this treatment. When I see somebody for the first time, I take an intake because when I'm looking at tens of thousands of nucleotides, and that's what I'm really looking at when I'm tens of thousands of variants in each individual, and the computer identifies like a few hundred that I look at, mm -hmm. um, often a thousand. Um, I really need to know the person very well to be able to figure out what's there and what's not and what makes a difference. And so I do take intakes that take a while and go over everything, go over the family history very carefully. I do everything on Zoom. I do as much of a physical exam as I can. But at that point, I usually, you know, recommend the, chroma, the um, genetic testing. And at the same time, I recommend to try different products that are natural that hit the four major pathways. And I don't know if this is a good time now to go over the treatments that I usually use as, you know, this is what I'm waiting for the DNA to, to I, I, because I know that these things are extremely unlikely to hurt and that they're very likely to help and they help most people. And mm -hmm. then when I get the DNA, then I say, okay, this is what it is. We need to take more of this and we need to do that. And we need to add this drug, et cetera. Then I really can get into it. But a lot of times there's significant improvements before we get the DNA back because I'm hitting the main pathways. Okay. I'm hitting okay. the cation channels. I'm hitting the right. mitochondria, the neurotransmission, and the inflammation. Yeah. So I start with a combination product. Now, NeuroNeeds is a company that I'm one of the free founders of. And so I do have a conflict of interest with what, you know, is saying here. Mm -hmm. um, but there is another brand out there that's really very similar that the two of us that are the main, I'm the main creator of this. And, mm -hmm. um, and Jim Adams is the main creator of the other one, ANRC, um, have made our formulas very similar because every time one of us puts something in there, the other one likes, we add to it and we talk at <laughs> lectures in it. The idea is to help as many kids as possible. There's right. enough room for two different brands. Sure. sure. Um, Neural Needs is a company that I'm involved with. Spectrum Needs is 33 active ingredients that's in a powder form, liquid and berry. 
and then um, flavors. And then there's energy needs, which is almost exactly the same, which is meant for adolescents or older. Usually around 10 or so, I usually try to switch them over. It's a little cheaper on energy needs. It's swallowing. If you can swallow capsules, it's a little bit more adult dosing on things. Mm -hmm. But the, it's either spectrum needs if you can't swallow, energy needs if you can swallow, it's twice a day. Mm -hmm. and it takes a two to three months to kick in. That's because oh. it's helping mitochondria mm -hmm. and, and everything else, all the other pathways. And then and once you've helped that, then the brain can start to heal. And then after the brain starts to heal, then you can start to learn. It takes time. Mm -hmm. There's actually, you know, the ANRC has a double blind study that has already been published on it, but for spectrum needs and um, with um, coenzyme Q10, which is our brand Q needs, um, we just got the data back from a double blind placebo controlled trial showing that it had dramatic effects on helping mitochondria as well as decreasing aberrant behaviors, helping the, the caregivers on their stress level and increasing communication, which is exactly what my patients are telling me that it's improved. But we now we have proof, scientific proof that it, it does what we think it does. Right. Both products have proof behind it. Um, so I- What's I, in them? Like vitamins um, and- uh, 33 active ingredients. There's a, a lot Just of in general, minerals, but they're at higher doses and they're more, they're more bioavailable forms than the cheap ones in a multivitamin. Mm -hmm. Plus there's a lot of things like, uh, there's a lot of things like molybdenum and chromium and, and inositol and choline that are really vitamins and minerals that are needed that are not in standard multivitamins. And then it's a multi, and then it's a mitochondrial cocktail. Um, mitochondrial cocktail having about 25 ingredients, which help the mitochondria make more energy and to detoxify the mitochondria because so the mitochondria is not making energy very well. It burns fuel, sugars and fats halfway. And the half burned fuels are pollutions and they hurt, they hurt the cells. They hurt the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. Same as a car, if you're trying to go up a, you know, on a road really fast, pulling a trailer on a mountainside, you know, <laughs> You, you're pushing it to the limit. It's going to make a lot of smoke, half burn gasoline. It's going to damage the engine. Right. It's really the same thing. We need to kind of detoxify that as well. Plus, there's some secret sauce to it. Our gene to open up the blood vessels, creatine to get some more battery power into the brain and multiple other things in there. Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's very three different things. Mm -hmm. So um, those, it's a powder. It's it, energy needs is a powder inside the capsules. And then of course, spectrum needs is a powder. You can mix it with any liquid in any amount. Mm -hmm. um, so you can dilute it to taste or, you know, mix it to taste. Mm -hmm. And, but there are two other ones that are very highly oil soluble, not water soluble that won't mix in. It's just not bioavailable. It just doesn't go across into, you know, into the blood. Mm -hmm. And one is the coenzyme Q10, which is needed to make energy plus is a great antioxidant. And we sell that under the label Q needs. The vast majority of the coenzyme Q10 over the counter is pretty useless. It doesn't bring blood levels high in my experience. I always get blood levels in my patients. I try to get them from between four and seven, which is high. But um, there was one brand of Konica Ubiquinol in lemaline oil that is very highly bioavailable. And I private label that under Q needs. Mm -hmm. And then the omega-3 fatty acids. I don't know if anyone has spoken to your group about those before. No. Mm -mm. Omega-3s are made by microorganisms. They're not really made by plants or animals. So um, cavemen got a lot of it because they ate fruit and vegetables and stuff that had dirt and mildew and mm. mold on it. Right. A lot of omega-3s in those. They didn't wash their fruit. Okay. Mm -hmm. They just mm -hmm. ate it. Mm -hmm. But now factory farming, it's all of that stuff is removed. And if it's not, people throw it away. Mm -hmm. And so we don't get the microorganisms unless you're eating a lot of kimchi and unusual, like very sharp cheddar or things like that. You know, some of the yeast products, people don't get the microorganisms these days. Mm -hmm. Factory farming, people are very deficient. You can get it from the sea because the plankton is a microorganism that goes up the food chain, but farm fish is fed corn. It's not in there. The farm fish isn't going to have the omega threes. So mm -hmm. omega threes are important for general health. Not outside of autism, it's good for everybody. It's needed. Right. But for most people, fish oil is great. But for people with neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, the problem is is that it doesn't go across the blood brain barrier. It needs to be phospholipid bound. I know this is getting really into the weeds, but if it comes from krill, it's phospholipid brown. It goes straight into brain. 
Um, so I made a product that's high dose fish because that's great for the heart, plus krill oil, which goes across the blood brain barrier and into the brain. And then plus um, sunflower seed derived phosphatidylserine, which is another thing that's needed. And then there's the phosphatidylcholine that's, that's in the krill attached to the omega threes because phosphatidylcholine is needed. So it's really like four different products in one. Mm -hmm. So I recommend that. Um, there is a brain bundle. You can get either spectrum needs or energy needs, depending on if you swallow or not, plus mm -hmm. Q needs, plus omega needs. And you can get it as what's called the brain bundle. Um, mm -hmm. It's at neuroneeds.com. Okay. And this yeah. is what I use in, in, in my patients. And most of them have, have improvement and many of them have quite a bit of improvement. Then I get the DNA and then I figure out the exact problem in that child. And then we direct it for that problem. And, and it's always different because there's always different DNA variants. I right. may find the same. Yeah. I was going to ask second. you to give me some examples of some kids that you've had and, and how you've treated them and what kind of success you've had. Well, I've had ones that have been from, you know, I mean, one of the the girls that I talk about a lot in the conferences, um, she had autism, but was mostly high functioning. And then she got a viral illness and she went down to being catatonic. She was like an infant. Mm. She got better, but she was still, she was um, kindergarten in, in her abilities, even though that she was in the fifth grade and no eighth grade at the time. And um, she had kindergarten abilities. And then I found out that she had a cation problem and treated that with um, high potassium diet, high magnesium and mitochondrial cocktail and one drug, acetazolamide that drives potassium to the cells. And she went back to her previous baseline completely. Wow. I mean, so some case, and all, and she's now in college. I mean, so it's sometimes there are dramatic improvements. People that were nonverbal that are, that are talking Hmm. Um, it's obviously these are some of the more I I exaggerated cases, sure. but I've seen it. I'd say yeah. the average is a moderate improvement mm -hmm. more than just, oh, there's some improvement, you know, it's Listen, even if they just sleep better or you see an improvement in the behaviors, you know, and less, less, you know, stimming and the, you know, fight or flight, you know, if it calms them down, you know, even that's like a big win, even if they don't speak, it's just, Sleep would be huge. <laughs> Behavior is a big one that Im improves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for those that have really significant anxiety, um, what I'll use is um, things that will help inhibitory neurotransmitters to rebalance that inhibitory excitatory balance. Mm -hmm. GABA and serotonin are the main inhibitory neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. So I have another product called Calm Needs. It's GABA itself. It seems to work in some people, plus L-theanine, which is from T, and that helps ga increases GABA plus magnesium and vitamin B6 that help GABA. And then 5-hydroxytryptophan is made into serotonin in a couple steps. Right. So, um, the, and so most of my patients that take that, take that in the morning because of school anxiety, social anxiety, or test anxiety, and it reduces it a lot. It also can help the other products work if anxiety is keeping them hyperactive. Right. Well, I was going to ask about ADHD. I mean, th th this sounds like that would help kids with that I'm, too. Um, well, Instead of sticking I, them on Ritalin. It... it you know, there are patients that do need the medications because otherwise they will fail. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of patients that I have on ADHD that the brain bundle has gotten them off the medications completely. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that the stimulants also increase mitochondrial demand. So they decrease mitochondrial energy because they increase demand. They're stimulants. They make the cells hyperactive. What do you mean? What stimulants? The, um, the stimulants that are used for ADHD usually cause mitochondrial dysfunction as well. Oh, the medications you mean? Medications. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the stimulants, medications. So that's okay. another reason to consider a mitochondrial cocktail if you're on the medications. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people with ADHD, in my opinion, they can be treated naturally. Um, the krill plus fish, the omega needs, that is a huge one. That makes a big difference in them. And then I have a, another product called Focus Needs is what I use for kind of the mild ADHD ones that don't want to take the whole brain bundle. Mm -hmm. um, Focus Needs is one box, but it contains two containers in it. One soluble in water, one soluble in oil. They can't mix, right? The oil one is exactly the same as Omega Needs. That works really well in ADHD. Mm -hmm. And the other one is a vitamin and mineral supplement. It's not the same as Energy Needs. It has 10 instead of 40 ingredients, but it's kind of the main 10. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a step down, much cheaper and quite effective in ADHD. 
-hmm. For someone that's on the spectrum with ADHD, I would consider the brain bundle or with very severe ADHD. But for somebody with mild or maybe even moderate ADHD, the products also, I think a lot of the people that use the product don't have ADHD. What they have is modern life. We're not supposed to be sitting in front of a computer for eight hours. That taxes the average person. Yeah. But if but you can help focus beyond average if you if you treat it with the same things. Mm -hmm. Would it be okay for somebody listening to just go ahead and order it and just try it, or is it something that they should talk to the doctor first before they take it? There's two answers to that. Okay. <laughs> There's the attorney approved answer. Okay. okay. Always discuss every treatment with your physician. With your physician, regardless correct. what it is. Yes. The reality is, is that most people are not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Side effects, I've never seen a severe or an irreversible side effect. In other words, if you stop it, whatever it is, will always go away. Mm -hmm. The two side effects which are most common are nausea, which anything by mouth can cause nausea. If you start low, go slow and take it with a meal. Nausea is pretty rare. And the other one is sometimes, well, the mitochondria are more energized, so people just feel more energized and they, you know, they don't like that or they don't like their kid being more energized. Start low, go slow, take it with a meal. Sure, that but you, we don't want that for ADHD kids. We don't want them more energized. <laughs> um, if you start low and go slow, that's not usually a problem. Some right. people just can't get up to the full dose. The full dose is based on the weight and it's written on the website as well as on the label. So okay. Some people just can't get to the full dose. It's, um, yeah. but but it, it doesn't matter because it a half dose or so will be fine in them. Right. So it's by the I was going to say, is there an age, you know, like what age would you start them at? Um, well, I mean, they're all natural products. I've used them before in infants. It's just as oh, yeah. infant, just a smaller dose. Be, yes, it would be important, I think, in an infant to have a physician behind it. Yeah. But I think that For any, sure. around the kindergarten age or so beyond that, it, it's it's dose based on, on the weight and it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Right. The weight okay. All right. Uh, what do you think about, um, mercury detox? I see a lot of that going around though with the sprays and things that people are I'm not really saying cures that. autism. I'm just saying, is that a, like there, it just if sounds mercury, like there's a lot more to it than that. Well, if mercury is high and, and, and in biomed, that's one of the things that's checked then there are certain things you'll want to do, like trying to reduce whatever it is that's making your mercury high, I think would be the main thing. Right. There are a lot of biomed doctors that do detox. I tend to stay away from that area. I try to look at the genetic side of it because right. I'm pretty busy on that side. Yeah. Let yeah. other people deal with the environmental side, even though I totally understand that in genetics and environment is important in everything, but I'm the mm -hmm. genetist. So. Right. Okay. But the, but, but your neuro needs stuff doesn't necessarily detox. Um, well, it will, it won't detox heavy metals. It's not what it's designed for, but it will detox. I mean, I wouldn't use the word detox, but it does reduce free radicals. It okay. will reduce organic acids and acetylcarnitines and many of the other intermediates of metabolism, which can damage the cell and make autism worse. Hmm. So there's a lot of things in it, like carnitine and glycine that are typically used in detox regimens. Right. Um, and so they're not detoxing the heavy metals, but they're detoxing the intermediates of metabolism. Okay. And then one of the other things that I know that you specialize in is um, the cyclic vomiting um, and and migraines, right? I did not seizures. Um, Se well, I, well no, I do with that too. Um, mm -hmm. It's... Um, paradoxical neurological situations. It's some, um, I'm sorry, paroxysmal is the word. Um, it, things that come and things that go, like migraines or seizures or right. cyclic vomiting episodes, they come and they go. Um, those I deal with. Sometimes they're psychiatric. Sometimes they're the the person is like out and has brain fog. Sometimes it's nausea and vomiting. Sometimes it's pain. Sometimes it's it, it could be anything. It could be dizziness. Right. But, that, you know, spells, episodes, whatever you want to call it. Often right. they're considered to be seizures. You do an EEG and it comes back normal and everyone's blaming the child or the parent. They've got to be making it up. They're doing something. Mm -hmm. so these things are very common. There's a lot, and they're often channelopathies. Often they're mitochondrial disorders. And it's the same genes. In fact, a okay. lot of with autism will have these problems. And that's how I got Right. Well, my son did. This is why I ask. Yeah. Because, okay. You know, he, he would have these bouts of the cyclical vomiting and then he'd have the seizure. Um, 
And the neurologist had said that it's kind of like when people with a migraine will get nauseous and throw up. He said it's kind of the same thing. They can kind of come together, yeah. the, the vomiting with the seizure. Yeah, but yeah, I, no, I you know, but he passed away from a seizure. So obviously the meds oh. didn't work. <laughs> so like I, I'm sort of looking at what's the root of that, you know, and, and most of the moms that know me and know my story, they all fear that that's going to happen to their child. And I have another friend that just called me last week, their 26 year old son just passed away from a seizure. So, you know, what, what's behind the seizures and, and is there anything that, that can be done to um, prevent them? Yes. Well, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy is a real issue. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't really been discussed until in the last decade. No one really even spoke about it at all. And now it's kind of gotten out there. Um, epilepsy is very frequently a channelopathy, an abnormal ion channel problem. And so I very strongly recommend DNA testing on that. There's a lot of drugs for epilepsy, but finding the exact cause of the epilepsy, A, may suggest a natural treatment that will work, or at least be synergistic with the medication, and B, which medication to start with in case you're just trying different ones. Mm -hmm. Is there something that you can pick up genetically about that with the seizures? Yes. Like, is there some, my... so the parents that fear this, what I'm asking is, can they come to you and you could do some type of testing and then and you can help to, to make sure that's not yeah. happening. There's two ways to come to me. I mean, I practice everything on Zoom. And so I see patients all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic is going to officially end this January 1st, in case people didn't know, it's gone January 1st. <laughs> Until January 1st, I can practice medicine anywhere in the United States. After January 1st, I can only practice where I have a license. Got it. I have a license in California, Arizona, Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, New Jersey. Woo -hoo. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get a Texas license. Okay. So that I know that leaves out people in the Midwest, and we're talking about maybe getting an Illinois license, but they're very expensive, and you have to follow all of the state rules for each state, and it's a lot of things. Yeah. But anyway, there's many things that can be done. First of all, People will travel to one of the state where I'm licensed. Mm -hmm. For the pandemic, people were doing it all the time. Right. Uh, another thing is we can do what's called a peer to peer, and that I can work with the doctor to order the right, make sure he orders the or she orders the right test, that I interpret the test and helps the doctor know how to treat it. So their pediatrician could call you. Pediatricians, I will work with sometimes, but that it's sometimes a little bit problematic on a pediatrician because then they get a 40 page report, you know, that all this stuff and it's a little bit beyond them. Right. A biomed doctor or a neurologist would be better or a developmental okay. pediatrician. Oh, I mean, okay. I developmental doctor, pediatrician. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like Dr. Fry and Dr. Rossignol and Dr. Skolrone and Dr. And, um, Dr. Elliot and a lot of um, Ellis and a lot of other ones out there I work with. I work with, you know, the the um, MAPS doctors all over the country and all over the world. Plus I can work with your neurologist or GI doctor of cyclic vomiting syndrome. Um, it, I have worked with general pediatricians before. It's just somewhat problematic because then they're given, it's a little bit beyond what they can take on. But, uh, but if they don't live in one of the states that you're in, right? Let's say they're in, I don't know, Tennessee. Well, so they could that. have one of those, they could go to a, a biomedical doctor or somebody and they can get, they can get in touch with you and work. That right. Way. They can go to a biomed doctor and that person can contact me and I can work with that doctor and give mm -hmm. them the genetic report and all the recommendations. Okay. What often people will do is to do, have the best of both worlds mm -hmm. is they go to a biomed doctor and they work with the biomed doctor, but then they travel to a state in which I'm licensed and for the time I discuss the DNA, a one-time trip. And then if the child, it doesn't matter where I am, it doesn't matter where the parent is, it matters where the patient is. I don't make the rules, I just stay out of jail, okay? Right. I don't, I, it's <laughs> no sense at all, no sense. Got it. Okay, it's, I mean, but like in Tennessee, they can come to the Florida Panhandle or whatever, you know, take a little vacation there or so, right. get, on, get on the Zoom call, mm -hmm. and yep. I, can, I can ask questions of the family, I can evaluate the patient. Right. They can ask questions about the treatment and everything, and they can really be an involved part of it. And then the biomed doctor can take it from then on. They're not okay. always having to travel every time they would need to, something right. needs to be. Right. And how do you do the testing? With the hair or swabbed in the cheek or how is it done? Um, usually they spit in a cup. Okay. And saliva sent by mail. 
Okay. Um, for those that won't spit, there's two options. There's the special Q-tip in which you rub the cheek, yep. and there's the blood test. We usually use the Q-tip or the saliva. Yeah, well, that's a lot less invasive than trying to get a blood test out of an autistic kid. <laughs> Very, and, and it's also not easy to take an autistic kid to a doctor's office. I've spent decades taking care of autistic kids while they systematically, you know, took apart the room. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. We think, you know, we think our rooms are autism kid proof, but then one of those kids will find something we missed. They will find a way. <laughs> we'll find it. Yeah. Yes, they And will. we never see them at their best. So now I do is, you know, is I talk to the parents while the kid's playing in the background has no idea that he's being watched. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's easier on everybody. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Awesome. Um, how can they get in touch with you? Let's put your contact information out. I'm going to give you Liz's information and I don't even know it because I just put Liz in the email and it comes up. Okay. L. Vahey, um, just Dr. Bowles, D-R, and then B-O-L-E-S. And then there's the C at the end, stands for clinic. So okay. L. Vahey, L-V-A-H-E-Y, D-R-B-O-L-E-S, C -E uh -huh. -E at gmail.com. At gmail. Okay. But you have a website, though. They can also... I do. I have a website. It's Molecular Mito Doctor, I think. Molecular Mito MD. Let me just double check that. Um, I found that I just called. typed in, um, Richard Bowles and I found your website very easily. In Google. Okay. Molecular Mito MD, something like that. Yep. That's my mm -hmm. website. And Liz, um, is my coordinator and you have. Okay. Liz. Email. So that's the L V A H E Y L V A H E. That's her. Yeah. That her name? My L is just doc. It's Dr. Bowles at moleculormito.com. Molecular, um, mm -hmm. M-I-T-O for Mito, dot com. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. It was a great interview. Lots of really wonderful information. And um, I thank you for being here today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay. Okay. So now, all right. That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed listening and it helped you gain a new perspective. To learn more about our children's book series, Robbie's World and His Spectrum of Adventures, or to learn more about what we do at Robbie's World Foundation, simply visit our website at robbiesworldbook.com. Thank you for joining us today. Be sure to join us again on our next episode of Spectrum Perspectives.